Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. In this episode, I spoke with my two amazing colleagues, Ivan Dugalic and Steven Van Balen, about message-driven architecture and message schemas. This conversation was split into two parts. I hope you enjoy the first half of our conversation, and let's have a listen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I am so glad to be talking to the both of you, Ivan and Steven. And um, you have both been my guests in the past, but not uh, together in one session. So I'm even more excited to have you here because I know I'm going to learn a lot uh, um, out of this conversation. So it's uh, it's a really exciting time for me. Um, so before we get into the topic of uh, events and uh, events uh, design and schemas and uh, schema evolution and all of that, uh, let's go ahead and do a short introduction for uh, the two of you. If you'd like to say something about yourselves, where you're located, uh, a bit about what you do and um, anything you'd like to share, I'm more than happy to listen and learn more about you. <laughs> so Stephen, if you'd like to start, go for it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me uh, once again, uh, Sarah. It's uh, it's always lovely to uh, well just chat about the things that uh, make uh, make excellent tick and what we do. I very much enjoy doing so. So uh, hi everybody. I'm Stephen. I'm the Axon Framework Lead Developer at Exonic, and uh, well, that's what I do. So I work a lot with the framework. Uh, I work on it. You will definitely see my name pop about if you want to contribute or if you have questions. Uh, that can either be on, on GitHub, maybe on our forum, on Stack Overflow. You can uh, find me throughout. And I, uh, well, enjoy explaining it. Hence why I'm uh, in this session as well. Awesome. And you're good at explaining it. So it's always nice to have you, <laughs> which is great. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, of course. And it's great to have you, Stephen. Thank you for being here. So, Ivan, if you'd like to go for it. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sara. Hi, Stephen. Hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Ivan. It's nice to be here again, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. And uh, yes, my, my role is solutions architect. So mainly I'm facing our customers, clients, and partners around the world. We are trying to figure it out uh, what, what problems really are and uh, how can we fix them? So providing a solution for them by using usually Exxon framework as a programming model and then also Exxon server as an infrastructure component, which is a database, you know, it's an event store and also like a messaging platform. So that's me in short. <laughs> Fantastic. And I think it's worth mentioning that we're kind of in uh, three different places right now. You guys are on the same time zone and uh, I'm, I'm a bit behind you just a tad. Um, but yeah, it's really great to have this opportunity to just really collaborate together. Um, Steven is, uh, if I can share, you're in the Netherlands. Uh, Ivan is in... Um, is in Serbia and uh, I'm here in the States. And um, yeah, so it's great to have you guys. And so let's get right to it. Um, one of the questions that um, comes up quite often is about um, events, basically, right? Um, and a lot of folks are, uh, when they come to learn about event sourcing and event-driven architecture, and you hear all of these uh, wonderful terminologies and jargons that come at you, um, the one of the concepts that they think about constantly is events and how do we design these events however there's more to it right it's not just about events at least for us it's not just about events it's about a lot more than that so let's first though talk about what are we talking about when we say event driven what is event driven okay uh should i go steven would you mind? Yeah, sure. Sure. Take this one, uh, Yvonne. <laughs> uh, yes, event driven. Well, uh, obviously, we are driven by events. So uh, the, the question is, what, what is the event itself? So uh, usually event represents a fact, a new state in our system. Right? So uh, let's not talk about how that event will end up in our system. But uh, we should realize that this is like a new state that we now have in our system. And it's modeled very formally as an event. So you can call it also a fact. But we are also using this event not to store the information and store the current state of our system, but also to communicate that state uh, with other systems as well that might be included into the art landscape. Right? Usually, 
uh, these days we are creating distributed applications, which we call event-driven applications, right? That then are using these events to communicate to each other, right? By sharing uh, these messages. And uh, the question is rising, do we really use only events to communicate across the systems? Uh, uh, or there are some other types of messages as well that we can share and integrate uh, two or three different systems as well. So, uh, but uh, we like to call them event driven. Uh, it's, a, it's a different approach than just like, uh, you know, a, a synchronous architecture that we maybe got used to over the time, which is rest most of the time, when you provide some rest endpoint and then you consume it. Uh, so you send a request and you get the response. It's very uh, synchronous operation. But uh, these messaging API that we are going to talk about today, they're more like of async nature, right? So you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they tend to, let's say, decouple these systems a little bit more uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we are we are not going to wait for that response of the other system for I don't know three or four seconds, and users are not really affected. So there is no like runtime, let's say, uh, coupling uh, uh, or less runtime coupling if you use this kind of messaging API. So why we call it uh, why we call them events, right? In event driven, this is uh, some something that we might just discuss uh, yet in this call. I hope so, because yeah, absolutely. Just we'll get more there. than events, of course. definitely. Of yeah. course. So then I guess there is two two sides to it, right? Events on, on the one hand, uh, we're talking about, of course, messages. So uh, they're a form of APIs, right? And um, and on the other hand, um, not necessarily on the other hand, but sort of um, in, in sort of conjunction with that events are um, facts, they're, they're what we call history, right? A lot of times they, they're immutable and so forth. So um, it's it's important to, I think, keep that in mind as well, because then now we're talking, uh, not at this moment, but in a few minutes, as we, we will start talking about the um, schema evolution and how to you know design schemas as the um, applications and systems grow. Um, that's just kind of keep in mind that events are basically facts, but there's a but, so we'll get to that as well. How can we, how can we go forward with that? But one thing that I want to really go back to and focus is that we, we did talk about event driven. However, as you beautifully mentioned, is not just about events. We are talking about messages. There, so there are different types of messages that um, in. Uh, the past through some of the other ep uh, episodes of the, this particular podcast we have talked about. But let's go ahead and do a bit of a recap on that. Um, and Stephen, if you'd like to take this one. Um, so we don't necessarily want to call it event driven. We want to more so call it message driven because we're talking about other messages as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? And um, what are the other messages and why don't we call want to call it necessarily event driven but message driven? Surely I can uh, can take that one. Um <laughs> What, what very well resonates for me, I think that was, this was the first time that I actually figured, why are we just using the term event-driven architecture? Why is, it, why, why is this the way? Um, is uh, when our uh, uh, Lord and Savior, almost, no, 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 joking aside, uh, when our CTO, uh, Allard, was actually doing a presentation. Don't give him that much power. <laughs> uh, he doesn't deserve it, right? He doesn't deserve it. He, he, he needs us as well. He needs our shoulders to carry the load. We joking, joking, say aside. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> J joking aside, he, uh, he had a presentation and he was pointing out why communication in the past tense isn't always helpful. And I like, like that wording, really. If all the communication we have between, well, the, the three of us, for example, is, have you done this? Have you done that? Why are, haven't you done this? Or that, that just doesn't work. You're always waiting for what fact already occurred you need to have the freedom to actually ask something or yeah. immediately ask somebody to do something and force them to do something and this is this makes it so that if you just be event driven you're always working in the past tense you're always running behind the facts and you can make that work there are plenty of systems that are just event driven but actually having separate messages for those intents by doing a command so expression of intent to perform some operation or doing a query, the request for information uh, as separate types of messages 
makes our flow of communication between components so more easy to understand. Right. So this is why uh, I believe, and I think uh, the, the three of us actually believe that using the term message-driven architecture is actually a lot more reasonable. You're not yeah. driving your entire communication just on past tense. Mm -hmm. No, you're also doing those other types. So you have and actually separate it's, messages. It's so funny that you mentioned this because uh, this reminds me of a really funny conversation I did have with Allard a while ago. And um, I kind of remember if we were recording or if it was just uh, one of my many conversations uh, that end up in joking and, um, you know, of course, involving uh, real life examples with, with Allard was that if you use a past tense with your partner, he was saying, imagine if I told my wife, have you gotten me a drink? What kind of response do you think she would give me? I said, you're lucky you're not asking me because if my husband did that to me, he will get a wooden spoon coming out of him. So, <laughs> so, yes, that's why we need different types of messages. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely important. And the other types of messages, of course, in our particular case, we're talking about commands and queries um, yeah, for, for our particular purposes here. So just to... Um, uh, kind of recap that because we have talked about messages and different types of it in the past uh, in as extents. But um, so with that in mind, um, so now that we know there are ty other types of messages and we can use these other types of messages, um, can we talk a little bit about schema of these messages and how can we design um, those schemas? Yeah, I think we can. Okay, sh shall I give a very short uh, what, what I had in mind? Please. Is the schema uh, is, uh, in, in most cases, the serialized format of those things. And that is very unself-explanatory, I think. So, uh, Yvonne, uh, I'm, I'm very confident you can dive into that in far more detail. Uh, I love I the short did. and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give the short and sweet, then we jump over to you. I'll try, I'll try. Thank you, Steven. Yeah. yeah, like, uh, if you think about uh, these messages, right, usually... Uh, you know, by developing this, like uh, I'm an engineer now, like, and uh, I developed some Java class or Kotlin class, really doesn't matter. So I work with that, but that's not that's not schema, right? This is just like a model uh, of that schema, of that structure in the source code. What is more important is uh, the structure uh, when you translate that Java class, right? into something that is readable, human readable, for example. It doesn't have to be human readable, but think about JSON, right, for example, or, on any, uh, or, or some, some XML. And in this case, you like, as, as Steven mentioned, you are serializing that Java class into some structure that is almost human readable, so you can understand it. But, you know, you need also a definition of that structure, right? So you need to make sure that you understand which attribute in that structure is mandatory, which is optional, which is a string, which is an integer, right? So that's a definition of the structure. And, and, and that, that can maybe be a definition of the scheme, just a definition of, of the structure of these messages uh, in a way, right? So, and that schema is essentially very important for us. You know, when someone is providing the API, let's say there is some command handler, right? Uh, uh, which is responsible to handle some command and I should send that to to that command handler, I should send that command. Uh, that guy uh, down below should explain, right? What is the scheme of that command? So I can construct it on my end and I can send it over the wire. But before I do that, I need to understand how to do it. And uh, usually these schemas are described in many different ways. They can be described in, within some, I don't know, like schema registry, for example, can be a simple uh, PDF file, uh, just you know, documenting uh, the schema uh, of it and share that with other teams that are going to consume it. But essentially, you know, schema is just the definition of the structure of these messages uh, that we are going to send, or maybe we are going to subscribe to these messages. So usually, you send a command and you subscribe to event uh, that is coming to you. So there is also a direction of the message that is flowing over the wire. Right. Don't be confused with the direction of the message that is flowing over the wire with who is actually providing that API, because right. uh, it could be one component, uh, actually, that is, let's say, exposing an event uh, or publishing an event to someone, or maybe having a command handler 
and being able to, let's say, handle that particular command. But that doesn't make the fact that command and the event are the schema API of uh, this particular component. But gotcha. the direction of the message that is going over the wire is totally different. Like in case of the command, I'm sending it as a client to you, to the API provider. In the case of the event, provider is publishing that event, uh, you know, uh, in a pub sub semantics like to me. So don't be confused because essentially there is a lot of documentation uh, online uh, and uh, most of that documentation is putting like the product they sell in a way in the center, uh, like, uh, and they are watching the systems from that perspective. Like, obviously, if you're a broker and you position yourself in the center of the broker, everything from the left will be a producer of the message and everything on the right will be just a consumer of the message. Right. But try to think about, you know, uh, try to take about a wider stand, like a, a, a higher perspective and watch your landscape uh, of systems, like, uh, you know, from, from the top you will realize that, uh, you know, the direction of the dependency to which API we actually depend on is much more important if we are going to talk about schema evolution than how messages are really applied. This is not much. Important. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I do like to um, dive a little bit deeper into, one, the serializers, uh, different types of them a little bit. And also, um, as you just mentioned, the producer and the um, consumer. And the upstream, downstream kind of um, um, ideas behind that as well. So um, first, let's talk a little bit about the serializers. So we, um, as you short and sweetly mentioned, Stephen, that um, the schema basically <laughs> is um, how are we serializing these messages and so forth. So I did have a, a really great episode with... Um, uh, Simon and Jan uh, mm -hmm. last season, I believe, uh, about our serializer. So we kind of yeah. dived deep into it and we talked about that. So obviously that's one one of the serializers that can be used um, as Ivan mentioned, JSON. Uh, another thing, within Axon Framework, however, we do have a default serializer, right? Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about that and um, maybe just briefly or as, as much as you want and uh, also... Do we have other options if we don't want to use the default? Yeah, sure. I can uh, I can share some specifics on this. So so right right before Yvonne started the, his explanation, I shared that what well, when I think of these schemas, I see it as the serialized format of, oh, of, of course, the yes. class really. Um, and the fact I'm saying that is really from the perspective of framework. Sure, I'm I'm, I'm the lead on that. So obviously, I take that stance. Um, See, see of it as um, the, the framework, by the way, provides currently two implementations of serializer, being the Jackson serializer, thus using Jackson to serialize and deserialize to and from JSON. Uh, and then the other one is the extreme serializer using extreme to serialize to and from XML. Now, if you think of this, this contract uh, direction, if I am an application handling a command, like even put it that I am in charge of the schema of the command. I am the owner of it. I am to some extent the producer of that schema. If I choose that, um, in my case, the serializer to be extreme, essentially my contract becomes the, the XML format of that message. If somebody else then dispatches a message or that command to me in JSON format, then it wouldn't automatically work because I expect it to be XML. This is why I use that serialized format of the contract, um, which, uh, which yeah, well, I always find uh, interesting to put out. I, uh, I, honestly, I'm, I'm thinking what, what would be my, my next pointer to, to make. Do, do you have any, any questions for me, perhaps, based on what I just shared? <laughs> No, I guess um, uh, the what I wanted to also for for the listeners to know about which serializers we use and if we have uh, options basically not to use these serializers. Obviously, you can uh, uh, you know pick and choose what you like. We um, uh, we talked about Afro a little bit, and yeah. that's something that they can use as well. And there are you know other types as well. That so it's not um, you do have a default, but you can customize it basically. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So w w when it comes to framework applications, the, the serializer is 
just another interface. Uh, yeah. Currently having these two implementations inside Axon Framework, so Extreme and Jackson, uh, Jan, and Jan Galinsky and Simon Sambrowski built that uh, Avro serializer based on the Axon interface to yeah. deserialize to and from the, the Avro format, uh, mm -hmm. also taking in the schema approach that Avro has exactly. in place, exactly. which is uh, exactly. very interesting. Um, well, as it's just an interface, anybody can build any format they like. Right, absolutely. So also a completely custom new serialized format that uh, we call the Sarah, Ivan, and Steven serialized format. I don't know. It can be anything I like that. Let's, let's build it. Yeah. <laughs> Just a lot of work. So. And we need to shorten the name. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, great. So um, going back a little bit to uh, these... Um, types of messages and APIs that we talked about. So, um, and also talking about serializers, right? There is um, something that you mentioned, Yvonne, which was um, also mentioned by Stephen, the producer and the consumer. Can we talk, to, talk about those two a bit? What exactly is a producer? What is a consumer? Which one's upstream? Which one's downstream? And also, what mm -hmm. is upstream and what is downstream? So if you can yeah. take that on a little bit. All right. Yes. So, uh, well, depends from which context you're explaining what is producer and what is consumer, right? So, but I think it's a, it's essentially important to understand these terms from the context, uh, from the good context, right? From the context that you belong now at the moment. Right? And this is usually your domain uh, and uh, what you have to build right there to support it, right? To model it in source code. Right. So that's essentially my advice. Uh, so take that stand, like, uh, you know, uh, try to watch who is the producer and who is the consumer, you know, by observing that system from the top. So for example, producer can be uh, the one that is essentially creating a message, right? So if you, if you take that stand and uh, that perspective, uh, then someone who is physically creating a message like command in this case, right? You can call it a producer. It, it's totally valid thing to do, right? It makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that component is legally creating that uh, message and sending it over the wire. So we can call it a producer. But uh, that component that is sending, let's say, a command is essentially not owning that API, Stephen already mentioned. So there is other component on the other side to which we are sending this command that owns that API. It owns that schema, right? So that other component is actually responsible for creating that schema, making that, making these rules, right? Who is mandatory, who is optional and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the producer of the message itself is essentially just consuming that API. So uh, if you, if you watch it like that, then yes, maybe the producer of the message is uh, in this case, uh, the component that is essentially sending the command. But we can also say that uh, the component that is receiving a command uh, and handling a command is the producer of the API. So, mm -hmm. uh, so producer of what? Producer of message or producer of API? Right. So this is uh, this is now a tough topic, right? So uh, uh, I don't want to imply that uh, you use it like for this context or that context, but make it clear and make it consistent uh, within your landscape and within your team, so it's clear for everybody. Otherwise, uh, you will be confused, as I was, by Absolutely. reading many different yeah. documentations. Uh, so. so is it yeah. fair so I like then to, to call say it that... Like... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. So um, d uh, don't forget what, what you were going to mention, but is it fair then to say that um, in our context of messages, where we have the commands, queries, and events, that, uh, for instance, commands are the producers and events basically are the consumers? Can we assume that, or is that a wrong assumption? Uh, or is it depends? I like to, <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I it would always like depends, to, right? Uh, yeah. Exactly. I would like to call it like producer of API rather than, uh, than mm -hmm. producer of the message. So for me, it's very mm -hmm. much more uh, interesting, uh, you know, which API I'm calling, right? So uh, right. who I'm depending on, right? So for me, this is much more important than uh, how the message is reported. So uh, I tend to forget about, I don't care like uh, who is sending the command. Is it flowing from A to B or from B to C? 
go from B to A back, right? I don't really care. Uh, I, I more care like, okay, so I, I'm sending this command, obviously, uh, to someone to handle it. And uh, who owns that API? Who owns that schema? Uh, well, that, that's the other component downstream. Right? Uh, so yeah, I, I tend to watch it like that. So, so for me, it's more like, uh, you know, direction of the dependency. And actually here, if you have A and B components and A is sending a command towards B, obviously B is owning that API, right? right. Uh, B can also, let's say, publish on an event. Right, so uh, now B owning uh, commands and events as two types of uh, messages that we can consume. So how can we consume commands and events now exposed by application B? That's the question, right? We can do that mm -hmm. by sending command to it, right? So uh, I'm actually contacting the producer of that API by sending command to it, or you can subscribe uh, on event coming from B application. So, you know, semantics is a little bit different. Either you send right. command to the producer of the API or you subscribe to event coming from that producer of the API. Right? So uh, to put it like that, Sara, uh, I hope you don't mind I introduce this uh, simple example to make it more clear because it can be difficult. It can be confusing, right? Especially if you use producer and consumer as terms, right? Is it producer right. of the message itself? That's not important, or it's maybe like producer of the API. That's that's more important perspective, uh, right. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah that so, makes sense. So, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I add my? Yeah, if I um, yes, please. For, yeah. Thanks for that explanation, uh, Yvonne. I think that's uh, what we actually had a short chat about this a couple of days ago, which which I found very pleasant indeed, because you were using the terminology producer and consumer, and mm -hmm. I was also a bit put off by it because I, I yeah. tend to look at it from, from well, again, the framework perspective, uh, you have something that dispatches a command or mm. dispatches a query or applies an event. And mm. those are then handlers that handle commands and queries or react on an event. This mm. is also the signatures I tend to use for me that, that, that is how I think that is my, my language. Um, Again, I'm losing the point I wanted to make with this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm I'm, go I'm coming back to it. So it's the the when it comes to the commands, it's uh, the the idea of thinking about it from the CRS perspective that you have a command model and a query model. Command models handle commands, and essentially, it's the command models format that dictates whether that command can be handled. So it is in charge of that command. It's similar to, to those query models. They handle uh, that component, that swear, that cloud of things handles the query and thus dictates what that query should look like. Whereas when it is events, it is, it's a big history book of whatever has happened and anybody can handle it at any moment in time. So there it is actual the party that applied those events that is in the ownership of that API. And it's this inversion that is uh, intriguing and indeed complex because the majority of the uh, literature out there is event-driven architecture. So it is the one that publishes the event is the owner, whereas the one handling the event is the consumer. Mm -hmm. Whilst if you have a message-driven API, that is not necessarily the case at all situations. And that's right. just, yeah, right? And that is so, yeah, it, it, it's reasonable why why people mix it up, but uh, yeah, I I hope uh, the point is coming across because yeah, that's wonderful, I, wonderful. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, welcome to message driven systems, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this is the this is the heaven we wanted to arrive to, right? <laughs> We're here now, so now we can talk about. It. But but with that said, now there there was a question that came up. Um, I think in one of our conversations that. Uh, then are we modeling the event-driven context and message-driven context as uh, the one that are, are they sharing a language? And this this can be confusing, right? Because yeah. it's not ubiquitous, right? Indeed. As you just mentioned, it just can mean different things in different contexts. So then, you know, um, how, how do you deal with that? You know, it's that's it's, really uh, interesting. I guess the, the golden so, topic, right? Yes. Yes, very, very interesting question. I mean, you already put it nicely because you're using domain-driven design concepts, right? 
to describe this particular problem that we are talking about, right? This is excellent. Yeah. It's all about the context, right? Whenever you try to solve the problem, try to figure it out in which context you are trying to solve that particular problem. Mm -hmm. So when we, are, when we are talking about event-driven uh, and uh, VS, message-driven, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Producer and consumer now, uh, if you use the same term and you think it has the same meaning, you could be wrong because uh, maybe producer in event driven system is always one and single thing. And usually it is, especially because direction of the message flow, which is event in this case, is always in line with the direction of who is the producer of the API as well. But this is not matching uh, if you use the same term and you think that it has the same meaning in the, let's say, a message driven context situation, right? Then, uh, then we, we might just be confused and, and wrong. So let's redefine what is the producer and what is the consumer in a message driven system at first, yeah. so we can build them and implement them later on. So very nice, Sarah. Thank yeah. you very much for mentioning and that. I... <laughs> so you can use domain driven design for this as well. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't credit it to myself. You 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 had a, a good conversation with me a couple of days ago, and uh, the, some of these questions came up. And one of the things that you mentioned that I really like was that um the and uh, you put it in in our document, which was really great, was that um, aggregate is the producer of the command API. It's not the producer of uh, the command messages. Command gateway component does that, which I found so interesting. And it's just, it's just this one little sentence. But it's got so much meaning to it. So it was yeah. really interesting because we're still talking about, as Stephen mentioned, we're, we're talking about in the command model, right? But mm -hmm. within that command model, you have now this producer that does something that th it's not necessarily what you might think its responsibility is, which which I thought yeah. was really, really cool yeah. and interesting. So context, 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 right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, understand yeah, yeah. with context here. Yeah. So that's yes. that's really... That's really aggregate so, aggregate is uh, also a very important component. It's a tactical yeah. component from domain driven design, and uh, you know it's just a component that can handle a command and produce some sort of an event as a fact. But it's very interesting that you mentioned that because uh, uh, aggregate is the owner of that API, so it actually provides you a command as an API, so you can use it, right? You can send command right. to it. Uh, what if you? Uh, I mean, you own that thing, right? So you as an aggregate, you really team that constructed that aggregate owns that uh, message. So right. if you like to change that message, be careful, right? Because you're upstream. So we are coming to that point, what is upstream and downstream? You also asked that question, I didn't forget. Yeah. Um, so obviously, because you own that API, you're upstream. So you're responsible for evolving that API carefully so you don't break your downstream application. In this case, this is a command gateway, which has to construct that command, right? And send it to you. If you change that schema, if you change that command, let's say you remove attribute or maybe rename some attributes from there, that command gateway downstream now, right? Because it's using your API, uh, you are the boss, remember the aggregate is the boss. So you are using that thing. Uh, it, it, it can be broken because of that fact, right? So you change something, uh, the command gateway downstream didn't realize that and we are in trouble, we have issues. So uh, the provider of the API is always uh, uh, upstream uh, because you know every change that he do or she does, right, uh, will affect downstream applications that are using this API in one way or in another, right? So uh, always the provider of the API or uh, the, the one, the component that is exposing commands, events or queries, is upstream, the components that are, or systems, right? You, you can even scale, it doesn't have to be a component. We can talk about mm -hmm. systems, but uh, right. essentially it's the same thing, right? Just a different scale. Absolutely. Are downstream, they're always downstream, right? To it. Uh, and yeah. now, how do we evolve that? So now I'm opening another uh, discussion here. Uh, about, uh, you read my uh, mind, because I wanted to get there. I hope you liked my talk with Yvonne and Steven. Please join me next time to hear the rest of our conversation. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.